Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 46, The Spanish Civil War, part 11, To the Sea. This week, a big thank you goes out to Dennis and Philip for their donations to the podcast, and Zach, Sunny Side Up, Kelly, James, Chris, Philip, Liam, Mark, James, Travis, Roseanne, and Kevin for their support on Patreon, where they get access to special ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special Patreon-only episodes released once a month. If that sounds interesting to you, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members to find out more information. Before we get started today, a couple of administrative notes. Now, you may have noticed that I took the last month off. Uh, me and my wife had our second child back in February, and I just felt uh, like I wanted to take some time off to spend time with the family. So that's what I did. I also played some video games and watched a lot of rugby at odd hours of the night while trying to get the baby to sleep. But now I'm back into the swing of things. Along with that, I wanted to address, let's say, the mixed feedback that I've gotten on the Spanish Civil War interview series uh, now that it's over. Uh, And to say I got mixed reactions is probably the best way to describe it. I'm still pretty happy with the outcome, but I do think in some respect, having so many interviews over so short a period of time was certainly not for everyone, especially because for the last seven years, I've not been doing that. I also think that most of the negative responses I've gotten from people are are perhaps people who just aren't as interested in the Spanish Civil War as maybe I was or other listeners. Looking ahead, I I did want to say that there probably will not be a similar massive interview project for future series. You know, this is something uh, that I wanted to try. It was experimental. And I maybe went a little overboard. And now that's not to say that there won't maybe be some interviews here and there. Um, as we move forward, I've already contacted a couple of authors and historians to come on and talk about their work, but it will certainly not be as many. For now, I probably won't be putting out maybe one a month, maybe even less frequently than that, and they certainly won't replace the normal episode for that week. Uh, I think one of the problems with the Spanish Civil War uh, interview series was that I put it in addition to the normal episode because I wanted to make it clear that it wasn't replacing anything. But that just ended up being a lot of Spanish Civil War content. I also just very briefly wanted to talk about sort of the road ahead for the podcast. Uh, This is also another feedback item that I've gotten, the, the, the time that it is taking me, I guess I should say, to get to 1939. Now, I I did want to say that I'm not in any real hurry to get to the war. I believe I misjudged uh, how interested some listeners would be in the Spanish Civil War. But I do think that there are many important things to discuss in the interwar years, in the realm of politics and economics and the cultural history, and they all play an important part in in why various nations entered the war in the states that they were in, and why certain events happened. And one of the reasons I think that is so important is because the story from 1939 to 1945, there are a lot of nations that don't have a story beyond the mistakes that they made during the interwar period. You know, if if you look at places like Poland or or France or many other nations, all they have is the mistakes made during the interwar period and why those mistakes were so bad when the war started. And that's why I think uh, some of this interwar content is so important. And so just very briefly, what it looks like ahead. I plan to spend about eight episodes on the Second Sino-Japanese War, which takes us up to the fall of Nanking. Then we move into what I would call the traditional timeline on pre-war World War II things. So Anschluss, Munich, those sorts of things. Then in our final pre-war episodes, which either are later this year or early next spring, you can expect uh, 10 episodes or more of what I'm calling random military stuff which is just a grab bag of topics from viewpoints on strategic bombers to warship design to infantry tactics. There were so many plans and assumptions made about a future war in the 1920s and 30s, and those drastically altered military preparations and and the militaries that people would enter the war with, uh, some of which were mistakes, some of which would prove to be very, very good. And then, of course, we will get to Fall of Ice. The Panzers will roll into Poland um, eventually. I realize that this has been a pretty long administrative minute here on the podcast, but given the volume of feedback I've received, both positive and negative, I thought it was worth just kind of speaking about where we are going. Uh, 
we will now return to our regularly scheduled programming. The failure of the Brunetti Offensive in July 1937 would cause the Republican military to shift its focus away from central Spain and the areas around Madrid. And while the Brunetti attack did achieve its goal of diverting nationalist troops from the north, with the end of that attack, those resources would once again be heading back north, which necessitated renewed Republican offensives somewhere if they wanted to try and save the enclave. The decision was made to move troops to the north and into Aragon to make this next offensive effort. The attacks in this area would be the last attempt to try and save the northern enclave, and once again it would not be successful. With the fall of the enclave, another Republican attack would be launched, this time in late 1937 and into 1938. The target for this offensive would be the city of Teruel, in an area of nationalist control that jutted far out into Republican-held territory. This city was supported by supplies passing along the Zaragoza Road. In both cases, the attacks would be launched in response to nationalist plans. In the case of the Teruel offensive, Franco was also preparing to launch another assault on Madrid, but the hope was that the Republican attack would delay those efforts. Once the attack resulted in failure, it would be answered by a counteroffensive, which would be devastating, resulting in the nationalist forces being able to advance all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, cutting Republican territory in two. These attacks, while not the last Republican attempts at offensives, would end with the Republican army in an incredibly poor state and the overall course of the war strongly in favor of an eventual nationalist victory. While the decision had been made to move away from Madrid and central Spain for the next Republican attack, there was still the possibility of launching an attack in southwestern Spain, much like the earlier plans for the Estremadura attack. The decision was made to instead focus on the efforts in the north, with political reasons driving that decision as, as much as anything else. There were still concerns about the control that the central government had among the areas of Aragon and Catalonia, and so Negrin and the rest of the government hoped that by moving in military forces for an attack, they would be able to further suppress any anti-government groups while also preparing for the attack. The planning for an offensive gave the government an excuse for moving some of its best and often most highly communist-influenced troops into Aragon. On August 11th, the Council of Aragon, which had been set up early in the war by the various groups within the area, was dissolved by the orders from the central government. This was done after it had launched a complaint with the government about the actions of troops that had been moved into the area. Some anarchist troops had also led some protests uh, around the occupation of various areas by communist troops, but many of the anarchist heavy divisions were kept at the front and heavily occupied in preparation for the offensive to prevent them from fully understanding what was happening behind the front. What was happening behind the front was that various communist formations were being used to break up the anarchist collectives that had formed in rural areas of Aragon. Members of the Council of Aragon had been arrested, CNT offices were seized and shut down, and there were other arrests and even executions. There were some protests about what was happening among, even from, you know, non-anarchist political leaders. But the justification used was that the people in the collectives were simply being liberated from the collectives that had been forced upon them, which is a, a dubious justification at best. Now, with the political objectives achieved and more areas brought under direct government control, focus could shift to the planned attack. By the time that the attack did begin, on August 24th, one of the reasons for the attack was already gone, because the attack in Santander had already started. This did not prevent the attack from happening, it just really removed one of its primary goals. The plan for the attack, which is sometimes referred to as the Zaragoza Offensive, was nothing if not ambitious. The goal was to break through the nationalist front in several areas between Zuera and Belkite, uh, which were north and south of Zaragoza respectively. This meant that the attack was on almost a 100-kilometer front. The Republicans were able to achieve a solid level of air superiority in these areas. They had more resources both on the ground and in the air because so much of nationalist strength was still focused in the north. However, how these Republican units were used was, uh, let's call it less than optimal. They were not well supplied and the summertime heat caused water shortages to be a serious problem. The attacks that would occur and, and which would continue to occur for another two weeks were a complete disaster. The opening attacks failed to achieve any of their goals. They advanced a few kilometers along most of the front and captured a few villages, 
but nothing of any real value. This caused General Modesta and Lister, who were not on the best of terms in terms of their working relationship, to downsize any further objectives and to change their efforts from a broad front to just focusing on the capture of one city, Belkite. Here, the dedicated attacks would begin on September 1st, and the results would be similarly disappointing. A small number of nationalist defenders were able to hold out for several days, while the Republicans turned the entire town into a smoking pile of ruins. On September 6th, Belkite was finally captured. But by that point, all of the Republican strength had been spent, and they were unable to continue the attack to anything that resembled an actual useful objective. The exact number of casualties sustained on both sides is not well documented. It is possible that somewhere around 15,000 were suffered by the Republicans, with the Nationalist number almost certainly below that. The most important outcome is that yet more Republican resources were wasted in a large offensive effort that achieved essentially nothing. It did not capture territory or objectives of real value, it did not pause Nationalist efforts in the North, and so it didn't really achieve any of its real objectives. The success of the attacks in the North allowed the Nationalists to have an incredible freedom to choose where they wanted to make their next effort. They were provided with this freedom because of two developments. The first and most obvious was that they were able to move all of the troops and resources to any other area of the front. This included the aviation assets that had put so much focus of their efforts into those Northern attacks. They were also able to capture all of the Republican weapons and equipment that had been in the Northern Enclave, and this also expanded their conscription efforts into captured territory and gave them the equipment to arm those new conscripts. The only downside of these efforts is that it would take some time for the troops to be properly organized, equipped, and then moved into position, which would delay the next nationalist attack longer than Franco wanted if they were to be on the front before it began. To try and shorten the time that it would take to launch another attack, the initial plan for a nationalist attack in Aragon was discarded, and instead the focus was shifted back to Madrid. An action aimed at Madrid would require less resources and men than a larger attack into Aragon, which also had the possibility of encountering far more resistance. As with earlier attacks, the plan was to try and encircle Madrid to cut off the defenders in the city and to force them to surrender. The plan was to take the army of Maneuver and move it into Aragon, but instead of attacking east into Aragon, it would instead attack southwest along the Zaragoza to Madrid road. This angle of attack had been posed during earlier months, but the resources had never been available to actually make it happen due to the priority of northern operations. The army of Maneuver was made up of all of the best forces available to the Nationalist army at this point in the war which had all been put together for the purpose of launching attacks. After some further discussions and movements of troops, the beginning of this attack was set for December 18th. However, it would never happen, because it was disrupted by the Republican attack that would be launched four days earlier. The nationalist preparations for an attack in and around Aragon were well known to the Republicans. This was confirmed both by aerial reconnaissance and informants that were positioned behind the lines. There were also efforts by the troops under General Mera, most of which were anarchists, to cross through the lines to try and gather more information. What they found made it almost certain that there would be a nationalist attack in December which would target Madrid, which was exactly the nationalist plan, so good job, I guess. With this information, the question became what would be done to meet the attack. General Rojo, uh, who had been promoted to Brigadier General at this point, initially wanted to shift Republican focus south and resurrect the idea of the Estremadura attack. But with mounting evidence of what the nationalist plan was, uh, this was shelved. Uh, Resources just couldn't be sent south if they were needed elsewhere. Instead, the plan that would be implemented was that the nationalist attack would be preempted with one of their own. The goal was to force the forces that had been gathered together for an attack on Madrid to be siphoned off to meet the Republican effort. Rojo would describe it as an offensive-defensive operation, which only aimed at limited destruction of enemy forces while distracting them from their own objectives. As for a target, they knew it had to happen quickly, and it also had to be at an area that could not be ignored by the nationalists. For this reason, they chose the town of Teruel, which was at the end of a long nationalist salient which jutted out into Aragon. (laughs) 
It was also a relatively important position as it controlled the highways in the area and the river access to the Turia and Alfambra River. If the operation was successful and the nationalists did not respond, it would threaten the left flank of any advance that they wanted to do towards Madrid. There were some problems, though, primarily around the weather. The area was known for some pretty savage winter weather, and December 1937 would be no exception. For the operation, Rojo would be able to deploy about 40,000 men along with 100 artillery guns, tanks, and aircraft. However, one set of units that would not be joining in the attack were the International Brigades. The International Brigades had been a key feature of almost every major Republican effort up to this point in the Civil War, but by November 1937 they were beginning to be seen as a liability. There had been growing anger and frustration among the members of the brigades, and this had only been growing as many found that they were not allowed to go home, even though that they had believed that they were strictly volunteers that could go home when they wished to. Many of the volunteers had surrendered their passports upon arrival in Spain, and they were not returned. And the news of their treatment and the course of events in Spain had caused the various common turn organizations around Europe to drastically cut down on the number of people that they were encouraging to go to Spain. This had then forced the Republican leaders to start putting Spanish replacements within the units, which kept their numbers up but resulted in them becoming simply normal Republican units with a contingent of individuals who were far from thrilled to still be involved. All of this resulted in the international brigades simply being removed from any attacks. They would technically be in reserve, but this was mostly for propaganda reasons, with the Spanish communist leaders still hoping for a success that could be claimed to be partly caused by the international brigades, which would hopefully restart volunteer movement into Spain. Rojo's original date for the offensive was mid-November, but there was heavy snowfall which delayed preparations for the attack. This delay would stretch into weeks and into December, until eventually it would land on December 14th. The nationalist forces that were ready to meet them were less than well prepared. There were some troops of the 52nd Division and then some volunteers from the local area, but they were spread thin and they were heavily outnumbered with just 10,000 total defenders. The nationalist commanders also did not fully understand the scale of the coming Republican attack before roughly December 11th, just a few days before it began, when the signs of the coming attack were finally detected, fully understood, and confirmed. While the offensive would begin on December 14th, the snow would continue to fall, even as the Republican infantry began to move forward. During the night, they would infiltrate forward, which was a smart move and allowed for many nationalist positions around Teruel to be compromised before they even knew what was happening. The one benefit of attacking in such weather was that the defenders were taken mostly by surprise. The advance would continue over the next several days, and it would result in Teruel being completely surrounded, although the nationalists would maintain control of the city itself. When news arrived back at nationalist headquarters, they were shocked. A decision was made to do what the nationalists had already done so many times whenever the Republicans would attack. Instead of continuing on with other plans, Franco would opt into the challenge and start committing huge numbers of nationalist resources to meet the attack. At first, just small numbers of troops and resources were moved, some heavy artillery batteries, some Italian artillery, but the situation continued to deteriorate around Teruel. Republican troops would begin moving into the suburbs on December 20th. Just two days later, the attackers were at the literal walls of the city and were starting to make attacks against specific buildings to push forward. Republican artillery also was brought into close range to start to dismantle strong points that had been created and were manned by nationalist defenders as well as civilian volunteers. Franco was determined not to lose the city, and so the troops that were concentrated for the Madrid operation began to be dismantled, with troops sent to meet the attack. By December 22nd, the Madrid attack was cancelled completely, and all available resources were sent towards Teruel, where the constant bad weather also greatly reduced the advantage that the nationalists often enjoyed in the air. It was the turn of the nationalists to be slowed by weather, though, and the movement of troops into counterattack positions was slowed, and this meant that it would not be until the 29th that the counterattack would begin. In the meantime, it was critical that Teruel held out, with Franco sending the nationalist commander the message, Hold on and have confidence in Spain, as Spain has confidence in you. When the nationalist attack began, the artillery bombardment would once again be the largest of the war, and the weather even cleared a bit, which allowed a much greater presence of nationalist aircraft. 
But the results of this initial attack were quite disappointing, measured not in kilometers, but in hundreds of meters. The initial failures did not cause the counterattacks to be cancelled, though, and instead more resources were committed. On December 30th, four divisions of nationalist troops under the command of General Varela uh, began their advance, and they would be far more successful. The success of this attack triggered some serious panic among the Republican troops within the city of Teruel itself, and they feared that they themselves would soon be surrounded. This would cause the commander of the Republican 40th Division, whose troops were the ones actually making the urban assault, to abandon their positions. Fortunately for the Republicans, this mistake was not immediately taken advantage of, and by the time that they fully realized what was happening, the Republican orders had been rescinded and they were back in their positions before the Nationalists had a chance to take advantage of it. On December 31st, the Navarrese divisions, which had been so important to the northern operations, made some progress and were able to reach a point five kilometers from the city. But the weather would rapidly deteriorate on the last day of the year, and a blizzard would move over the battlefield that would last for four days and drop over a meter of snow. Such a massive snowfall halted all operations on both sides for almost two weeks, and the conditions for the troops was a miserable mix of wet and cold, with thousands put on the hospital list due to frostbite during this period. During the first day of the new year, additional Republican forces arrived around the city, making any relief efforts even more unlikely to succeed. With the halt of the nationalist attacks due to the weather, those that were still holding out inside the city, having been under siege for over three weeks, surrendered on January 7th. After the surrender was completed and the nationalist troops were on their way out of the city in Republican trucks, work immediately began on defenses to meet the expected nationalist counterattack. This attack would be launched, but not immediately, and instead the nationalists would target early February for their main effort. Even though the Republicans had managed to capture Teruel, the Republican gains were in no way secure, and this was made abundantly clear when the nationalist counterattack was launched on February 5th. The plan had been determined by General Varela for an attack on the large Republican salient that was present to the north of the city. This would be attacked both from the north and in the south, with the most optimistic hopes being for a double envelopment, which would then push for the river Alfambra to the east. In contrast to earlier attacks, the attack on February 5th would take place in very good weather conditions, allowing for the full advantage in the air that the nationalists were able to utilize. They were also heavily supported by artillery. The resulting attack would be a complete disaster for the Republican army. They were caught off guard and the retreat had to begin immediately. The disorganization would cause a huge amount of equipment and supplies to be left behind, while between 15 and 20,000 men would be casualties, about half of those being wounded and a third captured. With this success, Davila wanted to keep the momentum going, and on February 10th, an operation was ordered to move across the Alfambra and, and closer to Teruel itself, with the goal of eventually surrounding the Republican forces that had occupied the city. This attack would then be launched on February 13th, but then had to be postponed due to the weather until the 17th. The river was swollen by all the recent snow and ice, but that did not necessarily prevent crossing from being successful when it was launched a few days later. And after it was complete, the forces began to push south. At the same time as Davila's troops from the north were pushing south and reaching the heights over Teruel, from the south, Varela's forces launched an attack pushing north, and they would meet just outside the city, trapping all of the Republican forces inside. The commander would be able to personally escape, but he left all of his men behind, and they would surrender on February 22nd. In all, the counterattack had been a costly affair for both sides. It had taken place in the cold and, and often snowy weather of January and February, which had caused the number of casualties to balloon, not just due to enemy action, but also to sickness and frostbite. The nationalists would suffer over 40,000 casualties, maybe as high as 60,000. The Republican casualties were even higher, being between 54 and 60,000, with other estimates putting them at above 80,000. What had begun as an attack on a mostly meaningless area of the front had developed into one of the bloodiest battles of the war. The attrition that had occurred was something that the Republicans, who were now outnumbered by the Nationalist Army, could ill afford to bear. Unfortunately for the Republicans, their problems were not over, as Franco was not done with the Nationalist counterattack. After the recapture of the city of Teruel, the Nationalists were in a very good position, 
Not only had they erased any gains made by the Republicans, they had also been able to do so without fully committing their best forces from the Army of Maneuver to the effort. They had only arrived later, after the bulk of the Republican offensive had been met by other Nationalist troops. The Nationalists were also generally better at rotating their units out of the fighting, which meant that they were fresher during the second half of February. This would allow them to be used for another attack, and on February 24th, a meeting would be held among the Nationalist commanders in the area, and during this, Colonel Viggen would outline the plan for a massive attack on the northern end of the Teruel area towards Belkite. The primary objective would be to drive east and reach the Guadalupe River. This attack would be launched just two weeks in the future, with the start date on March 8th. In that time, the forces that were needed were redeployed from their previous positions, giving Devella a total of 27 divisions and 150,000 men, along with 700 artillery pieces and 600 aircraft, to use in its execution. This attack would include the first combat operations of what would become one of the most famous aircraft of the Second World War, the Junker 87, but you may know it as the Stuka. Redeploying all of these troops and their equipment was a logistical feat, and for the month following February 21st, as preparations and then the attack were launched, over 1,800 trains would be used to transport men and then supplies for the attack. The Republican government, now located in Barcelona, knew that there was a large increase in nationalist activity behind the front, but they continued to believe that the enemy's troops had to be as exhausted as their own. Critically, the Republican army was unable to replace troops that were on the front, and which had already played a large role in the Teruel actions from the previous month, and this left them deeply unprepared for what was to come. When the attack opened, almost from its first moments when the artillery started, it would go poorly for the Republican defenders. On March 9th, the artillery would begin at 6.30 a.m., and by the afternoon, one of the divisions involved had advanced 36 kilometers, had overrun the second line of Republican defenses, and had taken the city of Belkite. Not every part of the attack would result in such drastic advances, and in other areas, the advances would be, I'd call them much more reasonable, and in a few areas, they would actually be halted completely. But all along the front, even where there was initial success in the defense, those units were forced to retreat as everything fell apart around them. As the retreat turned into a rout, in many areas the orders came down to take advantage of the situation, and the instructions given to the attacking units were to continue as quickly as possible, as far as they possibly could. This would continue along two axes, one that would continue to push south of the Ebro River with the goal of reaching the coast as quickly as possible, and on the other side of the Ebro, the advance would push towards the Cinca River with the goal of establishing positions for the inevitable push into Catalonia. On the Republican side, there was complete chaos. Some units would try to make a stand at various points, only to be overwhelmed. Others had completely fallen apart and were in full-scale retreat. One commentator would note that, quote, The panic occurred almost simultaneously throughout one army corps, and then it spread like a contagion through the other. Weapons were thrown away, all attempts to restrain the men were ignored, and as the retreat continued, the units began to just melt away as desertion rates skyrocketed. There was really nothing that could be done to prevent the nationalist advance from continuing, and on April 15th, the nationalist forces would capture Vineros on the coast cutting Catalonia off from the Republican territory to the south. Adding on to all the casualties that had been suffered during the Teruel attack, another 50,000 troops would be either casualties or captured. The equivalent of 10 Republican divisions were either destroyed or had been made combat ineffective. It was a defeat that the Republicans would never really recover from. Next episode, we will discuss some of the fallout from the massive Republican defeats of late 1937 and early 1938 before looking at the final Republican attacks on the Ebro, the failure of which would begin the final chapter of the Spanish